We continue our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. And this week we're going to read Matthew in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 through 21. Jesus continues. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. <coughs> but whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father, who is in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I still can picture the images in the book that my parents used to read to me when I was a child. The last time I brought this story up, I was informed that it was not a child story. It was intended for adults. And I appreciate that. I think most of the time, most of the stories meant for adults are probably better given through the children. You can often hear that in the children's sermon, not always, but sometimes. The simpler message is the one that often speaks to us. The story that I'm talking about is the emperor's new clothes. And I remember as a child, as this strange man from another land, for those of you who haven't heard it a million times, comes and says to the king, if you just give me all of these riches, I will spin you beautiful clothes that only the wise can see. And in reality, he was just taking money, and the king and the emperor was naked. And no one spoke up until a young child finally said, the king is naked. And all the adults had to admit what they already knew. But as a child, I remember thinking to myself, why aren't the adults speaking up? They're adults. They do things right. I mean, it seemed basic. The man is naked and being and taking advantage of, and why don't they speak up and protect this person? I didn't get it then, but now as an adult, I get it. I'm pretty sure that some in the crowd actually willed themselves to see what was not there. They might have liked the king and were willing to believe anything he said, even when it ran counter to common decency and common sense. That was only part of it. It's the other part of the crowd that uh, worries me now. The other part of the crowd are those who have learned to just simply go quiet. We silence the voice in us that says, that is not right. Something is wrong here. Instead, we find ourselves watching as more and more people swallow lies as truth and decide not to do anything about it. So we turn on HGTV or ESPN or nothing at all. We just stopped paying attention. It took a child to remind them that silence is as bad as agreement. 
And it is part of this reason that some folks have found hope when they hear about the passions and understandings of the millennials and their voting habits, their desires. That there is a sense of hope in their wanting something authentic in the world. It's why, in some ways, why large numbers of young people have gotten excited when someone comes along and seems to cut through the fog and does not care what anyone thinks. It's amazing that when someone comes along who truly sounds authentic, which should just be a basic human thing, we get excited and we're a little surprised and somehow we become cynical and can't believe them. Because authentic people are hard to come by. Too often, we have learned the way to get along in the world is to put on masks, to play games, to never say what we really want, but kind of provide innuendo. And in the process of this, day after day, as we get older and older, we begin to lose touch with that part of ourselves where, frankly, we feel whole. Or maybe we've never even been there. But we can sense it in other people. And my sense is it's not just the millennials who all for authenticity. We've just given up on its possibility. The desire for authenticity is something that is getting a lot of press today. I recently read an article in Forbes magazine online entitled Authenticity, the Way to the Millennial's Heart. And in this article, Carl Moore, he introduces the importance of authenticity in leadership, as if it were a new concept. And that was going to be the way that we could reach these millennials, these strange beings who somehow aren't as cynical as we are. It was as if this was a novel idea, and after three pages, I thought to myself, he really could have put this on a note card. Don't be a liar. Don't be a jerk. Don't treat people like they're stupid. And people seem to like that, and you're likely to be more trusted, and they might willing to be work harder for you in the process. That's a large card, but still shorter than those three pages that I worked my way through. <laughs> the simple reality is it's not rocket science. It's not new. We've kind of given up on the idea. In fact, I think Shakespeare had something to say about this. In fact, actually Shakespeare wasn't talking about this. He was actually trying to portray Polonius as a blowhard, obnoxious person, but we've taken his famous line and turned it into this idea of self-actualization, above all, to thine own self be true. We've taken that to be the mantra of authenticity. And that's fine, Shakespeare might not have intended it, but people have always desired something of true purity, authenticity, or at least the attempt to try to be fully who God has called us to be, even if we didn't name it that way. This search for self, while honorable, if it truly is not grounded in anything deeper than a vague notion of happiness or feeling at home in one's skin, the truth is it's probably a bit more selfish than it ought to be. Similarly, I think it fits really well with the teaching of Ayn Rand. The concept of enlightened self-interest, somehow she believed that was possible, but it is flawed on a number of levels, let alone, well, basically, basic human psychology. We don't act in rational ways, most of us, or at least most. The truth is, the search for authenticity is a noble one that we should never give up on. When it is built upon something other than ourselves. This is what I mean. I think what Jesus is preaching about in this part of his sermon, when he comes to this part of the Sermon on the Mount, he's really talking about religious practices and the conditions of our hearts. Is what you do with your faith publicly who you are on the inside? Well, the truth is we all know all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all fall short in this journey. Some of us have just given up on it inwardly. The warning is to not just be religious, but to have a sense of wholeness in our practicing and following of Jesus. He's saying, basically, it isn't enough to go through the motions. We have to build on a foundation for those actions, or they will lack any deeper meaning. 
and the condition of our hearts won't change. So to the specific practices, almsgiving, we don't call it that today, but giving to others, giving to those in need. He doesn't go on here and say on and on about the way to figure out who are the worthy and who are the unworthy poor. He says, just give to them. And when you do, don't make a big deal out of it. He seems little interested in the condition of the poor. What he's concerned about is what we're doing with our money. In fact, earlier he says, give to everybody. Which I know doesn't really fit with all sorts of things we tend to believe in our society, but there is Jesus meddling now as opposed to preaching. Here, in this place, Jesus is concerned about the why of our giving. Is our desire to get noticed? To show how holy we are? The truth is being generous, developing a spirit of generosity is the goal, not the accolades. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about doing something for others, by the way. It's the aspect of trying to get the good feeling from other people going, wow, how wonderful you are. And the problem is, is that we all like affirmation. Some more than others, but we all like it on some level. And I think Jesus is saying the trouble is, is if we begin to do our lives and live our lives so that we please others, we'll lose ourselves in the process. Beware of practicing your piety for others. Jesus doesn't say don't be pious. I know that word today sound has all sorts of baggage, so I'll say something about that in a minute. But Jesus doesn't say don't do these things. Don't fast, don't give away, just line your own pockets. He says, don't do it so publicly. Beware of doing it publicly, because it comes with risk. People notice, and then they're going to start looking at the rest of your lives. Someone says, oh, you go to church? He does not say, you can give up going to church. He does not say you can give up praying. He does not say you can give up giving to others or studying the Bible or anything religious at all and still be my followers. Because you can't. There was an article a few weeks ago that said, the truth is you really can't skip going to church forever and ever and call yourself a follower of Jesus because, well, his followers never followed him all by themselves. What he is saying, though, that as you live your life publicly, you run the risk of getting tripped up of showing that the, at the end of the day, we all lack full authenticity, but some of us are called to walk that journey with honesty when we fall down and do it publicly. This is part of the journey of authenticity. My favorite passage, though, in this particular section of the sermon is the one on prayer. I've said it before. He says, when you pray, go into a space where no one else can hear you. Close the door. And I am convinced that it is because there are things that we need to say to God that no one else should hear. Now this is a tough one for us, I think. But it is important to remember that God can handle the heavy stuff. God can handle our anger and our rage at God. There are plenty of witnesses in the Old Testament particularly of the prophets yelling out God, saying, where are you in the midst of this? The Psalms are pretty good at this, by the way, especially the Psalms of the men. I am dying. Where are you? Now, that's not comfortable, good religious language. And it's also something we don't do on a Sunday morning. Because it might seem a little weird. And there are times where it would be appropriate. Some of you might know that I was a huge fan of the television show The West Wing. And there's a scene in this where the, pre the president is standing in the National Cathedral by himself, right in the front of the cathedral, and says, I'm not repeating what he's going to say for those who are worried, says something to God, basically damns our God, his God, for the pain and suffering and what was going on. And they talk about the fact that there was a whole front row of religious leaders who had been advisors who were there for the video, and Martin Sheen goes over to them and says, I just want you to know this is about to happen. 
and just wanted to prepare you. I apologize if it hurts your sensibility. And no one was without exception. They all said, I don't know of a pastor, a priest, or religious leader who hasn't done the same at some point because we have been close to the suffering of others. God is big enough for this stuff. And when we are able to speak like that to God, our prayer life will dramatically change. You know, when we pray here in church, we do it primarily in two big spaces. One is the prayer of confession. And if you're like me, the time of silence, some of you probably don't like it. I wish it was a little longer, which is always a reminder that I should be doing it every day. We don't give you enough time, really, for you to put all of your confession of sin in that silent space, unless we could go on for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. I'm not saying I know horrible things about you, but that's just the reality. It takes us a while to put away, what are we going to do after church? Did the crock pot get plugged in? What have I got to do? Oh, right, I'm supposed to be praying. <clears throat> Our prayer life, and what Jesus is saying is, is that there has to be a private aspect to it. Otherwise, it kind of stays on the surface. And then there's that call to fast. <clears throat> well, this one's an easy one. He says those, he doesn't say everybody who fasts are hypocrites. What he says is those who fast and let everybody know that they're doing it while they're doing it, and look how much they're suffering. You get what Jesus is beating up here is really the idea that we're not supposed to be hypocrites about our practice in life. And how do we do that is by practicing it and failing and practicing again and failing, and practicing again. It's really a lifetime. It's not something we can pick up easily. It is, at the end of the day, about how do we help the orientation of our hearts? Why are we doing what we're doing, and to what end? We've not been called to be perfect in the sense, but we've been called to practice, to work towards the end goal, to practice our faith, to follow Jesus, to spend time, Yesterday, many of you know, those of you who didn't even know her, it occurred to me after the service, a couple of folks came up after Grace's funeral service and said, I just, did, I didn't know her very well, but I just can't believe anybody was really like what you all were saying about her. And the truth is, she really was. She was not a perfect person. She would have she would have bridled at that like nobody's business, but she was a kind person and a loving person and a praying person, and she didn't get there overnight. She is, I said, that she's a saint of the church, but she is not unique in that sense. What made her different was that she practiced every day, that she faced suffering in her life, and she kept at it. Was she perfect? No, we all have our blind spots. But I remember as I was driving back to St. Louis thinking, she got to that stage over 94 years. She had time to practice. To practice, to fail, to practice, to offer ourselves grace and forgiveness, and to keep doing them. Attend to the orientation of your heart. It is not one grand flash, but it is over a lifetime prayer, and study, and giving, and loving, and in the process recognizing that we will fall down. The only problem will be is if we refuse to get it.